In a realm of boundless possibilities, where dreams merge with reality and hearts pulse with hope, an incomprehensible force resides. Within the mind, where stars sway to the melodies of our deepest desires, esteemed author Joseph Murphy invites us on an extraordinary odyssey to the core of faith. In the magic of faith, words transform into murmuring melodies that transport us beyond the tangible world. Murphy, with the finesse of a master wordsmith, spins an enthralling tale that ignites the dormant divine spark within each of us. Each chapter opens a new portal to the marvelous journey of believing in the impossible and manifesting it into reality. Embark on a voyage where boundaries blur and limits dissolve, guided by faith, the thread that weaves through our endeavors and leads us to the fulfillment of our deepest aspirations. Immerse yourself in this text and let the enchantment of faith envelop you, a power that transcends dimensions, reminding us that even in the darkest moments, hope's light endures. Are you ready to embrace the extraordinary? Join us on this expedition into uncharted realms where faith unlocks the universe's infinite possibilities. Chapter 1. The Song of Triumph Tell me you whom my soul loves, where you pasture your flock, where you make it lie down at noon. For why should I be like one who veils herself beside the flocks of your companions? If you do not know, O most beautiful among women, go out in the footsteps of the sheep and pasture your young goats beside the shepherd's tents. I compare you, my love, to my mare harnessed to Pharaoh's chariot. Your cheeks are beautiful among the ornaments, your neck is like an ivory tower. We will make for you ornaments of gold, studded with silver buttons. While the king was at his table, my nard gave forth its fragrance. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms in the vineyards of Engidi. Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves. Behold, you are beautiful, my beloved, truly lovely. Our couch is green. The beams of our house are cedar. Our rafters are pine. I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. Like an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the young men. I desired to sit in his shade, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Sustain me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am sick with love. Let his left hand be under my head, and his right hand embrace me. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the field, that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. When your heart is filled with love and goodwill, and you radiate peace, you truly sing God's song. It is the song of the joyful soul. The real you is an eternal and perfect spiritual being. Now, you are a living expression of God. I said, you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. When you pray, it is a romance with God, or with your good, your desire. When it is fulfilled, it brings you joy and peace. To realize the desire of your heart, which is depicted in the Song of Songs as your beloved, you must court it. Let this desire captivate, support, and move you. Let it ignite your imagination. You will always move in the direction of the dominant desire in your mind. Most psychology students know that the Song of Songs is a beautiful depiction of the wonderful romance between the conscious and unconscious mind. Solomon and the Queen of Sheba say, O oh, you whom my soul loves, where do you pasture your flock? Your fulfilled desire is what your soul loves. You are asked where you feed, in other words, what you mentally dwell upon. The flock represents your thoughts, ideas, opinions, and beliefs. You must delight in nothing but the joy of prayer. If you say to yourself, I can't, it's too late, I'm too old, or I don't know the right people. You are not making your flock rest at noon. At noon, the sun casts no shadow. Similarly, when you pray, you must not allow any shadow of fear or doubt to cross your path or turn you away from your life's goal. The world of confusion will be rejected and you will meditate on the reality of your desire. Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves. The dove is a symbol of God's inner peace. Once I spoke to an alcoholic who said to me, Don't talk to me about these God things. I don't want God, I want healing. This man was deeply bitter towards his ex-wife who had remarried, as well as harboring resentments towards several other people. 
he needed the eyes of the dove, which means he needed to see the truth that would grant him mental peace. I asked him to pray with me. All I ask of them is to be sincere. If he is, he will experience an inner peace that surpasses all human understanding. He relaxed his body, and I said to him, Imagine you are speaking to the invisible presence within you, the all-powerful force that created the cosmos, that can do anything. Give thanks for this inner peace, say it again and again. After ten minutes of silent meditation, he was blinded by an inner light, seemingly coming from the floor where he was. The whole room was flooded with light. He exclaimed, All I see is light. What's happening? Then he relaxed to sleep in my office and his face truly shone like the sun. He woke up after about fifteen minutes, completely at peace, saying, God is truly here. God is. This man had found his beloved. He had the eyes of the dove. As you fall asleep at night, tell your desire how right and wonderful it is to achieve it. Start to fall in love with your ideal. Praise it. Exalt it. Rise up, my love. Feel yourself becoming what you want to be. Go to sleep aware of becoming or doing what you desire. Once I told a man on one of the islands that he should sleep with the idea of success. He was selling magazine subscriptions and became a great success following this method. I suggested he think about success before sleeping, what success meant to him, what he would do if he succeeded. I told him to use his imagination. Then, as he was about to fall asleep, fall in love with the idea of success in this way. Repeat the word success over and over. He must enter into the mindset of success. Then, he falls asleep in the arms of his eternal lover, your lover. Your divine presence will realize what you accept as true. The conditions, experiences, and events of your life are called the children of your mind. He led me to the house of banquets, and his banner above me was love. The house of banquets is your own mind, where you entertain the idea or desire of your heart. To illustrate this point, how to entertain in this house of banquets of your own mind a young woman who had a special talent for singing had great difficulties finding something to do in the field of film, television or radio. She had been rejected so often that she feared developing a rejection complex. She heard me say on one of our radio programs that whatever the human mind could imagine and feel as true, it could achieve. She wrote that down, came to one of our classes, and began to practice entering the house of banquets, soothing the gears of her mind, relaxing her body simply by talking to it and telling it to relax. So she must obey you in this calm, relaxed and peaceful state, with all her attention focused on an imaginary film contract in her hand. She felt the reality of the joy and wonder of it all. She was now in the house of banquets, and the banner above her was love. Love is an emotional attachment. She was definitely and mentally attached to this contract. He calls things that are not as if they were and the invisible becomes visible. She made the contract become reality by emotionally attaching herself to the imaginary image of a contract in her mental banquet hall. She knew that what she imagined and believed had to come to pass in the three-dimensional world. Her left hand is under my head and her right hand grips me. The left hand is your deep and subjective feeling. The right hand is your disciplined imagination. As you begin to imagine and feel the reality of your desire, you unite the right and left hands in a divine embrace. Then occurs a union of idea and feeling. Another way to say this is that there is an agreement between the conscious and subconscious mind indicating answered prayer. You know that when there are no longer any arguments or doubts in your conscious or subconscious mind, your prayer is answered because both have agreed to touch it. And thus, my beloved spoke to me and said, Arise, my love, my fair one, and come. This is not what your purpose, goal, ambition, or desire tells you. For example, the idea of perfect health now beckons you and says, Rise up and forsake the belief in illness, limitation, pain, and aches for health, harmony, and mental peace. I had a long conversation with a man in England who had leg problems. He had been bedridden for nine months and could not stand or walk. The first thing I did was ask him what he would do if he were healed. He said he would resume polo, swimming, golf, and climbing the Alps, activities he did every year. That was the answer I was looking for. 
I explained to him in the simplest way how to regain perfect use of his legs. First, he imagined himself doing the things he would do. I painted him an imaginary picture for 15 to 20 minutes, three times a day. He sat in his studio and imagined playing polo. He assumed the mental state of actually playing the role of a polo player. He became the actor. An actor participates in the role. Note well that he did not see himself playing polo. That would be an illusion. He felt himself playing polo. He actualized this by living the drama in his mind or his banquet hall. At noon he calmed his mind, immobilized his body, felt his alpine clothes. On him, felt and imagined himself climbing the Alps, felt the cold air on his face, and heard the voices of his former associates. He lived the drama and felt the naturalness and tangibility of the rocks. In the evening, before sleeping, before entering the arms of his beloved, his deepest being played a round of golf. He held the club, touched the ball with his hand, set it up and teed off. He swung with his clubs and delighted in seeing where the ball went. When he felt like playing a good game, he went to sleep feeling very satisfied and happy with his experience. In two months, this man's leg was healed. He did all the things he had imagined doing. The idea of climbing the Alps, coupled with the desire to play polo again, told him, Arise, my love, my righteous one, and leave behind your belief in physical handicap. That's what the law of the subconscious does. It's a law of constraint. When you subjectively feel like you're swimming, for example, when you feel the coldness of the water and the naturalness of your different strokes, sooner or later you will find yourself swimming. No matter the obstacle, whether fear or physical condition, you will do what you have felt subjectively. Your desire, dream, ambition, goal or purpose is your saviour. It's walking down the aisle of your mind saying to yourself, Arise, my love, and go enjoy the good and glorious things of life. No matter the problem or its severity, you really have nothing else to do but convince yourself of the truth you affirm. As soon as you succeed in convincing yourself of the reality of your desire, the results will automatically follow. Your subconscious mind will faithfully reproduce what you impress upon it. The Bible says, Choose this day whom you will be. You have the freedom to choose the tone, feeling, or state of mind you enter into. The manifestation of your feeling or conviction is the secret of your lover or subconscious mind. So your external actions are determined by your subconscious beliefs and impressions. Your thoughts and feelings determine your destiny. The knowledge of truth now tells you, winter has passed, the rain is over and gone. Winter represents that cold state when seeds freeze in the bosom of the earth and nothing grows. Winter and all seasons are in your mind. Your desires, dreams, visions and goals in life are frozen within you because of fear, worry or false beliefs. You can now resurrect them by moving away from appearances, entering God's banquet hall within you and saying to yourself, I can be what I want to be. All I need to do is impress my subconscious mind with my desire for health, wealth, companionship or true location and it will express that state with which I have impressed it. Winter is over for you, so is the rain. Your mind may have been flooded with negative thoughts, causing a sense of depression and melancholy. This will trigger an outpouring of negative thoughts, false beliefs and erroneous opinions. Now you know that all you have to do is fill your mind with God's truths that have come to you since time immemorial. As you do this, it sweeps from your mind all that is not in accord with them. Winter and floods are over for you when you regularly and systematically fill your mind with the concept of peace, happiness, love and goodwill. You can do this by reading one of the Psalms like the 23rd or the 91st and feeling the truth of everything you say, or you can read aloud a good meditation on the real truths of God. By doing this, these truths enter through your eyes and ears, releasing a tremendous therapeutic vibration that runs through your whole mind and body. These healing and soothing vibrations destroy, neutralize, and erase all negative thoughts, fears, and diseases that have caused all the problems in your life. Their embodiment must disappear. So this is prayer. Do it often enough for it to become a habit. Prayer must also be a habit. Do everything from the standpoint of God alone and His love. For example, when you buy, pray before you buy, say, God guides me in all my purchases. 
Say it quietly to the saleswoman or salesman, God prospers this. Whatever you do, do it with love and goodwill. Spread love, peace and goodwill to all. I often affirm that God's love and transcendent beauty flow through all my thoughts, words and actions. Make it a habit. Fill your mind with eternal truths. Then you will see flowers appear on the earth. The time of birdsong has come. You will start to bloom. Yes, you will start to bloom. The earth represents your body, your environment, your social life and all necessary things in this objective plan. The flowers you observe will be the birth of God in your mind. The flowers of God's guidance will watch over you and lead you to green pastures and still waters. The flowers of God's love will fill your heart. Now, when you see discord somewhere, you will see God's love operating throughout His creation. As you become aware of this, you will see love emerge and bloom in others. When you enter a house and see confusion, quarrels and conflicts, you will realize within yourself that God's peace reigns supreme in the minds and hearts of all in that house. You will see peace manifest and express itself where you see lack and financial limitation. You will realize God's infinite abundance and wealth flowing forever, filling all empty vessels and leaving a divine surplus. As you do this, you will live in God's garden where only orchids and all beautiful flowers grow, for only God's ideas circulate in your mind. As you go to bed each night, clothe yourself in the garment of love, peace and joy. From now on you will always fall asleep, feeling that you are now what you desire to be. Your last concept as you fall asleep is engraved in your deepest mind. It will always resurrect it. Always bring into the banquet hall of your beloved a noble and Christian concept of yourself. Your beloved will always give you what you conceive and believe to be true. Whatever you can conceive, your beloved can give. Conception. Love illuminates all things. Your mornings are determined by your concept of yourself. As you fall asleep in the arms of your beloved, your ideal, the time of birdsong is near for you. When you stop singing that old song of lack that you've heard people sing, it's like an old gramophone record. I'm not so lonely. Things have never gone well for me. I never had my chance. I've been treated cruelly. I've had three operations. You should hear about all the money I've lost. Yes, then they talk about fear on the lonely road. In addition to your likes, dislikes, troubles and hatreds, filled with the love of God, you will no longer sing that song. You will sing the new song because God's ideas and truths will sing within you, so you will speak in a new language, um, which means the state of mind of peace, joy, goodwill and love. You will no longer react to people and conditions as you did. Now, you listen to God's song. Now, when someone says something mean or unpleasant to you, you will immediately transform it. By realizing that God's peace fills your soul, you will consume it with the fire of right thoughts. The birds will truly sing in your mind and heart as you do. You are happy, you overflow with enthusiasm, and you await with joyful anticipation all good things. Wherever you go, you carry peace with you. Everyone who enters your orbit is blessed by your inner light. Start seeing sermons in stones, languages in trees, songs in flowing streams, and God in everything. The voice of the turtle dove is now heard in your world. Tennyson said, Speak to him, for he hears. Spirit to spirit, he is nearer to you than hands and feet. The turtle dove's voice is the voice of peace, the voice of intuition and inner guidance. You can hear it by listening humbly. For example, once when I was a child I got lost in the forest. I sat under a tree and remembered a prayer that begins with Afmantha. He will show us the way. I remained silent and softly repeated, Father, guide us. A wave of peace washed over me. I still remember it. The voice of the turtle dove became real. The turtle dove is intuition, which means it is taught from within. An overwhelming feeling came over me to go in a certain direction as if I were being pushed forward. Two of the boys came with me, the others stayed. We were led out of that dense jungle as if by an invisible hand. Great musicians have heard and listened to inner music. They wrote what they heard internally in meditation. Lincoln heard the beginning of freedom. Beethoven heard the beginning of harmony. If you are deeply interested in the principle of mathematics, you will love it as you love it. It will reveal all its secrets to you. Jesus heard the voice of the turtle dove when he said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Mm -hmm. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. How wonderfully you will feel when you drink in these words 
and fill your mind with their therapeutic power. Job heard the voice of the turtle dove when he said, Agree with God and be at peace, thereby good will come to you. You now know how to distinguish the true from the false. You ask for it humbly. For example, once you've chosen, you clearly state what you want. Now you surrender your desire. The wisdom of God within you knows all, sees all, and has the know-how of fulfillment. You always know if you have truly submitted your request or not. If you are at peace about it, you have submitted it. If you are anxious and worried, you have not prayed it through. You haven't fully trusted in the wisdom of God within you. If you seek guidance, affirm that infinite intelligence is guiding you. Now, it will distinguish itself as the right action for you. You will know you have received the answer because the dove of peace whispers in your ear, Peace is here. You will know the divine answer because you will be at peace and your decision will be right. No Recently, a girl wondered whether she should accept a job in New York for much more money or stay in Los Angeles in her current position. At night, as she drifted off to sleep, she pondered this question. What would my reaction be if I had made the right decision? Now the answer came to her. I would feel wonderful. I would be happy that I made the right decision. Then, she said, I will act as if I made the right decision, and began to repeat over and over, Isn't it wonderful, isn't it wonderful, like a lullaby? And she fell asleep. In feeling, it is wonderful. She had a dream that night, and the voice in the dream told her, Stay calm, stay calm. She woke up immediately, and of course she knew it was the voice of the turtle dove, the voice of intuition, the fourth dimensional self within her, which can see ahead, knows all, sees all, reads the thoughts of business owners in the East. She stayed in her current position. Subsequent events proved the truth of her inner voice. The Eastern Company went bankrupt. I, the Lord, will make myself known to him in a vision, and I will speak to him in a dream. My beloved is mine, and I am his. He grazes his flock among the lilies. The lilies represent the poppies that grow in the east. Seeing the poppy field swaying in the breeze is a very beautiful sight. Here, the inspired biblical writer tells you to have a romance with God. As you turn to God's presence, he turns to you. You experience mystical marriage, marital bliss, when you fall madly in love with truth for truth's sake. Then, you fill yourself with new wine, with a new interpretation of life. Lilies symbolize beauty, order, symmetry, and proportion. By feeding on or delighting in the great truth that God is indescribable beauty, limitless love, absolute bliss, perfect harmony, and infinite peace, you truly feed among the lilies. When you affirm that what is true of God is true for you, miracles will happen in your life. By realizing and knowing that these qualities and attributes of God are expressing through you and that you are a channel for the divine, every atom of your being begins to dance to the rhythm of the eternal God. Beauty, order, harmony and peace appear in your mind, body and business world. By feeding among the lilies, you feel your unity with God, life and God's infinite riches. You are married to your beloved because now you are married to God. You are a bride of the Lord. From now on, you will give birth to the children of your beloved, who will bear the image and likeness of their father and mother. Father is the idea of God. Mother is love and feeling. Your health, your abundance, your happiness and your inner peace arise. Sit and feed among the lilies, realizing that every night of the year, as you fall asleep, you go before the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords and the Prince of Peace. Make sure you are properly dressed when entering His Holy Presence. If you were to appear before the President, you would wear your finest attire. The clothing you wear when entering the heavens of your own thoughts each night represents the state of mind or tone you use. Make sure it is always the wedding robe of love, peace and goodwill for all. Be absolutely certain that you can say, Behold, you are just. There must be no resentment, ill will, self-condemnation or criticism of anyone. The love of God must truly fill your heart for all people everywhere. You must sincerely desire for all what you desire for yourself. Then, you can say to your state of mind and feeling, Behold, you are just. And when you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive, 
so that your Father who is in heaven may also forgive you your offenses. My beloved is mine and I am his. All that God is is yours, for God is within you. All that you desire is already yours. You do not need outside help to feed among the lilies when you fall asleep tonight. Forgive everyone and imagine and feel your desire fulfilled. Become absolutely and totally indifferent to any thought of failure, for now you know the law. By accepting the end, you have desired, as Neville so beautifully stated, the means to achieve that end. As you are about to fall asleep, galvanize yourself in the feeling of being or having your desire. Your mental acceptance or feeling as you go to bed is the request you make to your lover. Then, she looks at your request with conviction in your subconscious mind, and being the absolute lover, she must give you what you have asked for. Feed among the lilies until daybreak, and the shadows flee. The shadows are fear, doubt, worry, anxiety, and all reasons why you cannot do something. The shadows of our five senses and racial belief hover over everyone's minds as we pray. When you pray, accept as true what your reason and five senses deny and reject. Remain faithful to your idea, full of faith every step of the way. When your consciousness is fully imbued with the acceptance of your desire, all fear will disappear. Have confidence in the reality of your ideal or desire until you are filled with the feeling of being. Then day will break and all shadows will flee. Yes, the answer to your prayer will come and illuminate the heavens of your mind, bringing you peace. No matter how acute, dark or desperate things may seem, turn now to God and declare how things are in God and in heaven. The answer will gently glide over your mind like dew from heaven. All is peace, joy, bliss, perfection, fullness, harmony, and beauty. Then dismiss the evidence of your senses and feed among the lilies of God and heaven as peace, harmony, joy, and perfection. Remember that what is true of God must be true for you and your environment. Continue in this unwavering confidence and faith in God until day breaks and shadows flee. Chapter 2 The Practice of the Presence of God where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. This psalm is one of the most beautiful in the Bible. It is a jewel of unparalleled and priceless truth. The language of this psalm is unmatched in its beauty and elegance. David's wonderful conception of the omnipresence of God is found in this passage. The religion described in the Bible is the practice of the presence of God. To understand and intelligently practice this truth, you will find the path to health, harmony, peace, and spiritual progress. The practice of the presence is powerful beyond imagination. Do not neglect it for its absolute simplicity. The first step is to realize that God is the only power. Then, Become aware that all things, whatever they may be, represent God in manifestation. The entire world is God in infinite forms, for God never repeats. That's the whole story, and the greatest of all truths. I know many students who sit for five or ten minutes each day and meditate on the fact that God is the only presence and power. They let their thoughts rest on this profound truth, examine it from every angle, and then begin to think that every person they meet is an expression of God that everything they see is indeed God manifested, God playing himself for the joy of expression. By doing this, they find that their whole world changes. They experience better health, external conditions improve, and they possess new vitality and energy. Your entire world will change when you truly begin to see God in everything and everyone, for you will be in league with the stones of the field, and the beasts of the field will be at peace with you and you will know that your dwelling will be in peace. This means that the person who begins to see God everywhere and continues to practice good will fear nothing. In fact, the whole world will be their friend, and everything will offer its help, whether animate or what the world calls inanimate. The only way to amplify God's presence in the eyes of others is to constantly radiate the light of God's love, love God or truth, and you will be under divine compulsion to do good. You cannot go wrong, you will find that you never make a real mistake or bad choice. 
Love for all things good or for truth is truly the Midas touch in a building. The superstructure depends on the foundations. Let your foundation be God and God alone. You are always practicing the presence of God when you activate your mind with true ideas that heal and strengthen you. Your mind needs constant cleansing, discipline, and direction. By practicing the presence of God, you are constantly cleaning your mind. This is prayer. Think all day long from the standpoint of the one God regarding every person and every situation you encounter. Pray at work, realizing that God is your companion, and God is in action through all your associates. Pray while driving your car, realizing that the vehicle is God's idea moving freely from one point to another, with joy and love. When you go into a store, realize that God is guiding your purchases, that God is prospering the employee who is serving you, and that the store is governed and directed by the wisdom of God. Let prayer be the orderly and correct way of doing everything. Practice the golden rule in all your transactions, so you write the law of God in your heart. It is essential for you to obtain the right concept and understanding of God. Have you meditated or asked yourself, what is God? Your concept of God shapes, molds, and forms your entire future. Your true belief in God is of paramount importance. You are made as you believe. If you declare and believe that God is the only presence, the only power, infinitely good, perfect love unlimited, and life unlimited, your whole life will be transformed. If you say, oh, I don't know what I think about God, my thoughts are confused and muddled, confusion will reign in your life. It really doesn't matter if you call God reality, infinite intelligence, being, life, Allah or Brahman. The true name of God for you is your concept or belief in God. A man once told me, I believe in God, and that's all that matters. I asked him, but tell me, what kind of God do you really believe in? He said, I believe in the laws of nature. That was his idea of God, and he cannot transcend that belief. He is bound by this belief, thus limiting his inner powers. He had no idea that God was his own life, that he could contact this presence through his thoughts, that he could be guided, and that he could heal his body through prayer. He was shackled by his limited belief in God. And many have told me that God is some sort of man in the sky, some glorified man. Others say and believe that there are three persons in God. Always, God will manifest the result of your belief. If you believe that God is some kind of inscrutable tyrant who lives in the heavens, ready to judge and punish you for your errors and violations of laws made by humans and religious taboos, you are bound by that belief, and you cause pain, misery, guilt complexes, etc. That's why Kimby said man is the expressed belief. Your concept of God enters into every area of your life. You are destined to feel its effect. God is life, and life seeks to express itself as love, light, truth, and beauty. Life cannot desire death or disease. To say that life desires death would be a violation of its own nature, Life cannot tend toward limitation of any kind. Life is unity, wholeness, and seeks to express that unity throughout the universe. To practice the presence, you must do the will of God. What does that mean? The will of God must always be the nature of God. You can be sure that the will of God must always be something wonderful and glorious. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. If your desire, idea, or intention is constructive, if it blesses others, and if it aligns with the universal principle of harmony, your desire or will is the will of God. Your desire for wealth, rightful place, abundance, security, and better living conditions corresponds to the will or tendency of life or God. Life always seeks to express itself through you at higher levels. Enthrone in your mind the concept that God is the only presence, the only power, and that God is infinitely good and perfect. Think of some of the qualities and attributes of God, such as unlimited love, infinite intelligence, indescribable beauty, omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence. Believe in these truths about God, and your whole life will change. You will begin to express more and more divine qualities every day. Believe that God is all life, all love, all truth, and all beauty. Accept it in the same way you accept the sun in the sky every morning, and you will find a great sense of peace and goodwill enveloping your mind and heart. 
Do you believe in a vindictive, capricious, anthropomorphic deity who sends you illnesses, trials, and tribulations? Observe the effect of such a belief. If you do, you will be like the man who once told me, God sent me this arthritis for a good purpose, and I suppose I must bear it. That's superstition. Such a mental attitude has no foundation. He had arthritis for 15 years and couldn't overcome it. When this arthritis-stricken man adopted a new concept of God and learned to forgive those he deeply felt wronged by, realizing that God's love dissolved in his mind and body everything that was not of itself, he was healed. Though it took a few months, this man's concept of God worked and manifested in his body according to his belief. It is not your theoretical belief in God that manifests, but it is your real, deep, subconscious belief. There are people who forget to practice the presence when a lawsuit or verdict goes against them. Even if the judge renders a verdict that seems unjust to them, they continue to believe that it is God in action and that there is a divine and harmonious solution for all parties involved. The matter will come in its own time. You cannot lose. You can only win by practicing the presence. If you believe that God is a man in the heavens, you must experience the results of this concept. Consequently, you experience confusion and problems, as if a human being with all his whims is running the world. God is a pure spirit, an infinite intelligence. The Bible calls the name of God I Am, which means to be pure and unconditional. Of course, no one can define God because God is infinite. But there are certain truths that the enlightened of all ages have perceived as truths of God. That is why the Bible says, I am who I am. That is your true being, your real being. No one else can say, I am for you. It is the presence of God in you and your true identity. Everything you put into I am and believe always becomes true. Say, I am strong, powerful, radiant, happy, joyful, illuminated, and inspired. Then you are truly practicing the presence because all these qualities are true of God. When you say, I am weak, I am inferior, I am not good, you deny God in you and lie about him. Brother Lawrence from the 17th century was a monk, a holy man, and completely devoted to God. The book titled The Practice of the Presence of God reveals great humility, simplicity, and a mystical touch with God. Doing the will of God was, as he said, his whole business. Brother Lawrence practiced presence by washing dishes or sweeping the floor. His attitude was that everything was the work of God. His awareness of the divine presence was no less when he worked in the kitchen than when he stood before the altar. The way of God was for Brother Lawrence through the heart and through love. His superiors were amazed by the man who, though educated only to read and write, could express himself with so much beauty, depth, and wisdom. It was the voice of God within him that drove all his words. That's how he daily practiced the holy presence of God. He indeed said, I put myself under your care, it's your business that is at stake, so everything will be fine. What a beautiful, what a simple, but how moving is this prayer, he said. He said that the only pain he could feel would be the loss of the sense of God's presence, but he never feared that, being fully aware of God's absolute love and goodness. In his early years of life, he feared condemnation. This torture of his mind persisted for four years, then he realized that the whole cause of this negativity was a lack of faith in God. Seeing this, he was released and entered a life of continuous joy. Brother Lawrence educated himself by cooking, baking or washing pans in the kitchen to take a break, if only for a moment. To think of God at the center of his being, to be aware of his presence and to maintain a hidden meeting with him because of his inner enlightenment. When he embraced the promptings of the Spirit, he entered into a realm of deep peace. Start practicing the presence now, keeping your eyes on God or on all good things, seeing God in everyone you meet and constantly affirming, this is God in action in every department of my life. Have complete trust and tranquility in the holy presence of God to lead you to green pastures and still waters. Love the truth with a love that leaves no room for worry or doubt. No matter your work, when you go about your business, say, God walks and speaks in me. I completely trust in God's guidance and wisdom. Thank you for the perfect day.
Do what Brother Lawrence suggests whenever your attention strays with fear or doubt. Bring it back to the contemplation of His Holy Presence to secure and know a life of peace and joy. Teach yourself daily to have an intimate, loving, familiar, and humble conversation with God throughout the day. In this way you will abundantly draw upon God's grace, be enlightened by an inner light, and contemplate the inner vision of God, your beloved. Case study case number one. This interesting case from my archives can bless many of you. This man invested a large sum of money in a particular organization. He held high esteem for the two men who were active partners in this business. They misappropriated the money he had given them for themselves and shortly thereafter declared bankruptcy. He was deeply bitter and felt resentment because he had virtually put his life savings into this venture. He was also sick from the hatred in his heart. I explained to him that resentment is never justified and that many people invest in land, bonds, etc. and have lost their money, but it's absurd to blame the broker or real estate agent because we erred in judgment. To a large extent, this man's resentment was caused by a sense of guilt for his own mistake that he refused to admit. He blamed the other men for an active resentment over his own failure and fault. He prayed his way through it by practicing his presence in this way. Now I radiate love and goodwill towards these two men, humbly, sincerely and honestly. I wish for them God's guidance, inner peace and divine love. I wish prosperity, success and richness of life for each of them. This is God in action in all departments of their lives. I say this sincerely. My mind is now clear, pure, serene and full of expectations of happiness. God guides me in all directions. No one can take away my happiness, peace or wealth. I am one with God and my business is God's business. I am now attending to my own affairs. The money I gave to these men returns to me in peace and harmony. I prayed night and day, and during the day when thoughts of hatred arose I said, God is with me. Now within two weeks I was at peace with the world. All thoughts of resentment were consumed in the depths of my mind, withering away as I realized that God was acting in my own life and in the lives of those I accused of harming me. Meanwhile, a relative passed away, and something interesting happened. The exact amount I had lost in that business was bequeathed to me. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. Case study number two. A young girl in our recent Bible class practiced the presence in this manner. She said that a man was constantly harassing her, calling her on the phone and meeting her at her workplace, one day she decided to do something about it. She relaxed, quieted the gears of her mind, and focused all her attention on the presence of God within her. Becoming aware that he was there, she whispered to herself, God never made a man like this. Only the God in him is speaking through me. God is all and only God can express himself through him. This man completely disappeared from her life. She never saw him again. She said it was as if the earth had swallowed him up, Undoubtedly he was healed and blessed by her prayer. She too experienced healing. Prayer always prospers. It is like the gentle rain from heaven, blessing both the giver and the receiver. She saw this man in a new light and then felt the change in him. He was healed and stopped bothering her. Love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Chapter 3. Realize Your Desire Desire is the force behind all action. We couldn't lift our hand or walk if we didn't have the desire, the need to move. Desire is the gift of God. As Brolin said, You give, my God, and I receive. Man receives not only some of life's gifts, but all. Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. Everything the Father has is mine. Our Father has in Him everything we need such as peace, harmony, abundance, guidance, joy, and infinite expression. We must continuously grow. We can never exhaust the infinite stock. Let us acknowledge some simple truths. It is because of desire that we jump out of the way of an approaching bus. The reason we do this is that we have a fundamental desire to preserve our lives. Self-preservation is the first law of nature, as illustrated by the farmer who plants seeds in order to get food for himself and his family, and by the man who builds planes in order to master time and space. Similar illustrations are found throughout our lives. Desire propels man, 
It is the engine of action. It is behind all progress. Desire is truly the cosmic impulse in each of us that drives us forward, upward, and toward God. Desire is God's angel, the messenger of the divine who tells each of us, rise higher. Desire is the basis of all progress. It is the vital force that propels us. We find that we follow the desire that captivates us and holds our attention. We all find ourselves moving in the direction of the idea dominating our minds. For now, desire is an angel of God speaking to us about something that, if accepted by us, will make our lives more complete and happier. The greater the expected benefit of desire, the stronger our desire. Where there is no expected benefit, gain or accumulated progress, there is no desire and therefore no action. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord. Our ideal murmur in our hearts is the Alpha, so that it becomes the Omega. We must enter into the feeling that it is ours now and walk on the earth knowing that it is so. Failure to realize our desire for a long period of time leads to frustration and unhappiness. I have spoken with many men in different parts of the country. Their frequent complaint is that they have tried in vain for years to achieve a certain ideal and position in life, that they have failed miserably. They did not know that the desire to be, to do, and to have was the sweet little voice speaking to them, and all that was needed was to say, Yes, Father, I accept it and believe it then walk on the earth knowing it is done. To illustrate, let us take the seed which draws all it needs, such as water, chemicals, etc., from the soil, and when it reaches above the ground, it draws sunlight through a process of photosynthesis, all the light and other elements necessary to form a complex substance called chlorophyll. She also has the intelligence within her to manufacture the most complex chemical compounds in her bark and leaves, beyond the reach of man to discover. Similarly, when man becomes the seed and knows that all things necessary for the development of his ideal will be given to him, he will attract to himself all that he needs for the complete realization of his dream, such as friends, funds, presentations, ideas, etc. All men, women and children who assist us on the path of life are servants of the law we set in motion within ourselves. My ways are not your ways. This infinite intelligence that we implement when we pray inspires many others to take the actions, words, and movements necessary to help us in the great development of our ideal or in the great drama of our life. It is absurd to blame or accuse others because we must realize that others are witnesses telling us who we are, as inside, so outside. If there is discord within, there will be discord without. If we remain in a state of lack and limitation, others must come and witness our lack. I met a woman in London once, and three times a thief snatched her purse in the London subway. She was a wealthy woman. The explanation for this is that she lived in fear of having her purse stolen. It was truly an expectation. What I fear most happens to me. The state of mind, feeling and belief in which we walk determines the movements and actions of others towards us. In the eleventh chapter of Mark it says, Therefore I say unto you what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. The word all in the preceding quotation means all things whatsoever. Ye desire are included. There are no specific conditions laid down. You do not have to be a churchgoer, or belong to any particular creed, nor do any sacrifices. Nay, nay, it is not in the sacrifices of men that I rejoice, nor by their power, but by the Spirit, says the Lord. What purpose has the multitude of your sacrifices? I am full of the fat of rams and the blood of bullocks. I do not rejoice in the blood of rams or goats. The only prerequisite is to believe that you already have it now, or that you are the being you aspire to be. To believe means to live in the state of being. It means complete mental acceptance, where there is no longer doubt or question in your mind. This is the state of consciousness called conviction. All other procedures cited by Isaiah are absurdities and superstitions. The only prerequisite beforehand is to believe that you have received, then comes the manifestation of your ideal. We grow through desire. It is desire that propels us forward, for it is the cosmic impulse. Understand that we are all channels of the divine. Individualization is of the consciousness of God. 
the desire that remains in your heart murmuring silently. Perhaps it has been there for months, letting you know that it is the voice of God speaking to you, telling you to rise higher, to rise up and shine. Perhaps you have looked around and said to yourself, How is this possible? Maybe Mary, but not me. Maybe one day, it's just an illusion, etc. Many of these expressions have come to your mind. Remember, this is your five senses and worldly reason arguing with your higher self. We must remember that in prayer, we always exclude the evidence of our senses and reason, as well as anything that contradicts or denies what we really want. So, as Jesus commands, let us go within, shut the door, and pray to our Father in secret. The Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Let us now enter this secret place and perform the spiritual and creative act in our own mind. Sit in an armchair, relax, and let go. Practice the technique of the Nancy School by entering a state of drowsiness and meditation, an effortless effort state where effort is minimized. For example, if you want to be a radio singer, imagine yourself in front of a microphone. The microphone is now before you and you see the imaginary audience. You are the actor. Act as if I were and will be you. Feel the situation. You are now singing in your imagination. Enter into the joy of it. Feel the emotion of accomplishment. Continue to do this in your imagination until it begins to feel natural to you. Then, go to bed. If you have successfully planted your desire in your subconscious mind, you will feel a great sense of peace and satisfaction when you wake up. An interesting thing will have happened. You will no longer feel the need to pray about it because it is fixed in your consciousness. The reason for this is that the creative act is complete and you are resting after a true prayer when you have achieved inner conviction. You will feel a sense of inner peace, calmness and certainty that will tell you that all is well. This is called the Sabbath in the Bible, or a period of tranquility or rest. It is the interval between the subjective realization of your desire and its manifestation. The form of manifestation is unknown to you. This is the secret of the subject. My ways have passed to find it. The answer or manifestation comes like a thief in the night. You know that a thief comes when you least expect it. There is always an element of surprise. Maybe when you are deeply asleep the thief will come. If you sit and watch and wait for the intruder, it will not come in the same way. We must attend to our daily affairs, and at the moment we think it will not happen, the answer will come. Now you are at peace completely, so to speak. You do not need to assist this infinite intelligence. It is all-powerful. It would be absurd to try to add power to power. The problem with many people is that when they pray, they are tense, anxious, and impatient. They wonder when it will happen. Others say why it has not happened yet. If I say why, it means I am anxious and lacking in faith. If I know something is true, I do not question my prayer. So, let us remind ourselves that every time we ask why to ourselves or another, it means we have not reached conviction within ourselves. When we possess something in consciousness, we do not seek it, we have it. Another point I want to emphasize here is that when the student asks how it will come, it shows a lack of faith and conviction. By illustration, I am now in Los Angeles. I do not ask how I will get there. I am there. Similarly, when our ideal is fixed in consciousness, we do not ask how we will get there. We are already there. Where your consciousness is, there also will I be. Case history. Case history number one. Several years ago, the author was giving a lecture at the Park Central Hotel in New York. A man approached me at the end of the meeting, saying that he desperately wanted to go to Pittsburgh and had no money. I said to him, Did you listen to the lecture? He replied, Yes, but I told him to ignore the doubts in his mind. We made a simple statement of truth together in that beautiful conference room. The statement was, Now I am at home in Pittsburgh with my family. Everything is peace and harmony. He was at home with them during those few minutes of silence in his imagination and feelings. Later, he called me and said, I went to the restaurant, and a man sitting next to me said, You know, I'm driving to Petersburg. I'd like someone to share the driving with me. I'll pay you too. You know anyone, you look like a mechanic. This was how infinite intelligence answered this man's prayer. Case history number two. I want to tell you about another experience I had in the army. A young soldier told me, 
You know, before the war, I tried to get into Bellevue Medical School for several years. They always turned me down, yet my grades were very good. This young man believed he was a victim of racial prejudice. He was assigned to my battalion. One evening we discussed the laws of life. I explained to him the relationship between the conscious and subconscious mind, detailed in my book, The Miracles of Your Mind. I explained that his subconscious mind had the answer, knew everything, and had the know-how to succeed. We reviewed a few experiments I had conducted years earlier with a psychologist refugee from Berlin. In one case, a child under these experiments became clairvoyant and described distant events, which we later verified. This child also pinpointed the location of lost objects and accurately predicted certain international incidents. We discussed how infinite intelligence and wisdom reside in man's subconscious mind and how it is possible to synchronize with it and make it work for us. Following our conversation, the following experience was suggested to him in the evening, as he prepared to fall asleep, he imagined seeing a medical diploma with his name on it, indicating he was a doctor and surgeon. He felt this diploma with his hand and imagined the joy it brought him. He made all of this real and natural by focusing on one thing, the diploma, the accomplished thing. Then he contemplated the reality of it. Believe that you have it now and you will receive it. He called things that are not as though they were, and the invisible became visible. I told him before it happened that once it happened, they might believe. These are perfect formulas for prayer. This boy went all the way. He asked himself this question, What will I really receive to prove to the world that I am a doctor? The answer came, a diploma in his imagination. He saw the diploma and made it real. He went to sleep feeling the diploma in his hand. For example, you can close your eyes now and feel silk or a fur coat on you. As you feel the fur you will receive it. The continuation of this soldier's prayer is very interesting. That morning he said to me, you know I have a feeling that something is going to happen and I won't be here for long. It was his subconscious telling him that everything would be okay. Do we sometimes know by intuition, inner awareness or feeling that our prayer is answered? Technically we would say that the idea has been subsumed or incarnated in the subconscious. In truth, we would say that the soldier accepted the idea in his consciousness and his inner knowing implemented it. The many words or phrases we use illustrate the same thing, that he felt its reality. That's all we need. The technique he used aided him in its realization. The commander called him and announced that, given his pre-medical training, he would be sent to Stanford instead of Bellevue as the army would sponsor his medical studies. It had been explained to him that he didn't need to go to Bellevue to become a doctor, that infinite intelligence would be his guide in prayer. Go all the way and realize that you are now what you desire to be. Then infinite intelligence takes over and acts upon the thoughts, ideas and actions of others to help us achieve our desire. Similarly, a seed attracts to itself all the things like chemicals, water, sunlight, air necessary for its growth. We always use this principle of power, intelligence and wisdom every day of our lives when we raise our hand to write, we use this power and energy in the same way. When we breathe, we use the same air. For example, I am writing now, the ideas expressed come from the single mind common to all individual men. There is only one source, and that is God. We are not the origin because all ideas live, move, and have their being in God. This infinite being, consciousness, or as we choose to call it, is the only original, the source of all. All men drink from this one source or spring. They will understand by these truths that when we look at the sun or a tree, we all see one sun and one tree, which proves that we all use the single mind. Therefore there is no such atheist because he could not see it, because he uses the mind, power and intelligence that belong to God. As a teacher, I wish to emphasize that there is no master who can give you something new, he cannot give you the truth either. All any master can do is awaken what is already in you. You host God, as the book of Revelation says, the tabernacle of God is with man. A master makes you see the truth that has always been there, lights a fire if he is a good master. Then you warm yourself by his glow, but the fire, glow, and warmth were always within you. The true master, if he has a good knowledge of the truth, 
will teach you freedom and will frankly tell you that you owe him no loyalty, for your heart belongs to God or truth, so that your own self is true as the night, the day. Then he cannot be false to any man. The master of truth will tell you that if you receive nothing from him, go elsewhere where you will be blessed. We call ours. There is no competition in truth. You don't have to fight for a goal, because the goal you seek already exists, and through your processing work, you take it over. Accepting desire in consciousness, all states coexist in the great moment or other dimensions of your mind. It is like the keyboard of a piano. The music you want to play is already in the piano. All you do is press the appropriate keys and chords to bring it out into the light. But the melody or sonata has always been there. Don't believe that you created it. All you did was recognize a particular composition and bring it out into the light. You can play pop on the piano, ghost, or a Beethoven sonata, the piano doesn't care. Similarly, look at the English alphabet. You didn't create it. It has always existed in the infinite mind. With this alphabet, you can write a beautiful life drama or a gossip column that could drive someone to suicide. We must press the key to bring our music into the light. Also, our music is harmony, health, peace, true place or expression in life. We press the right key by contemplating the reality of the desired state, now feeling and believing that we possess it. A simple illustration is as follows. Suppose you want to sell a house for $2,000, which is the price you would pay for it if roles were reversed. You are satisfied that this is the right price and there is no struggle in your consciousness. The next step is to see the end. A simple way to do this is to take a short, easy to remember phrase like it is sold or it is done and repeat it over and over like a lullaby until you feel its naturalness and reality. This last process is suggested by the new school of Nancy. I have seen many people sell properties in this manner. They see the check in their hand and feel the joy of success. Imagining that you have the check in hand is seeing the end and after seeing the end, you desire the means to achieve the end. Infinite Spirit will attract to you the person who wants what you have to offer. The price and timing will be right, and you will find that the transaction occurs in peace and harmony for all involved. Let him who is thirsty come, and let him who desires take the water of life freely. Revelation 22:17. The purpose of this chapter is to teach you the spiritual truth of your dominion and freedom. Acknowledge it in all your ways, and it will direct your paths. Proverbs 3 to 6. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? Psalm 121, 201. In the previous verse from Proverbs, you are told to acknowledge it. It will come when you turn in faith and gratitude to the divine principle within. It was Shakespeare who said, Our doubts are traitors and make us lose the good we oft might win by fearing to attempt. Fear stops us. Fear is a lack of faith in God or good. A man once told me he was a member of a sales force for a large chemical organization with 200 men in the field. The sales manager passed away and the vice president offered him the position, but he turned it down. Later, he realized the only reason he declined the offer was fear. He was afraid to try the responsibility. This man lacked faith in himself and his inner power, he doubted, and this wonderful opportunity slipped away from him. This salesman came to consult me and I found he was condemning himself, which was like a destructive mental poison. Instead of condemning himself, he began to realize there were other opportunities. I explained to him that faith is a way of thinking, a positive mental attitude, or a feeling of confidence that what you pray for will come to pass. For example, you have faith that the sun will rise tomorrow. You have faith that the seed you planted in the ground will grow. The electrician trusts that electricity will respond to its correct use. A scientist has an idea for an invention and proceeds with faith in executing the invisible idea. Opportunity always knocks at your door. The desire for health, harmony, peace and prosperity is knocking at your door now. Perhaps a promotion will be offered to you, act as Peter did once who walked on the waters. When Peter stepped out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink, crying out, Lord, save me. 
In addition to being historical, this drama of Peter and Jesus unfolds in your own head. Peter signifies faith, perseverance, and determination. Jesus represents your desire, which if fulfilled would be your savior. Jesus comes into your mind as an idea, desire, plan, goal, vision, or a new enterprise. The realization of your dreams, plans, or goals would bring great satisfaction and inner joy to you and others. This would be your Jesus. Now you must summon Peter, who is faith in the power of God to accomplish all things. Consider Peter and Jesus as representations of the power of truth within you. Often, when you try something new, for example, a new position, doubt comes to your mind. It is Peter within you, looking at the tumultuous wind and sinking. This represents the impact on your mind of the belief in failure, lack and limitation. You must immediately incinerate, burn and destroy this negative thought. You must not tolerate such a thought to live, which means you must replace the negative feeling with positive thoughts of success, peace and prosperity immediately and give your love and feelings to these concepts. As you maintain this confident state of mind, you will emerge victorious. Doubt and fear keep men enslaved to sickness and failure. These false concepts make them hesitate, falter, and doubt moving forward. The way to overcome is to increase your faith and awareness of your deep spiritual powers. Be like Peter. Move forward, because he continued. He had faith and confidence, knowing he would succeed. A general on the battlefield cannot afford to hesitate. When you find yourself torn in two ways, it is a sign of doubt and fear. Your good comes to you in the form of desire. If you are sick, you desire health. If you are poor, you desire wealth. If you are full of fear, you desire faith and confidence. Jesus comes as your desire walking the streets of your mind. There is another part of your mind that says, no, this cannot be. It is too late now. It is impossible. It is at this moment that you lift your eyes to the hills from whence comes your help, meaning you raise your gaze when you focus your attention on your good. Remember that faith can accomplish anything. Your faith has healed you. According to your faith, it has been done unto you. You must appreciate that your desire, idea, or dream is real, even if it is invisible. Knowing that the idea is real, that it is a fact of consciousness, gives you faith and enables you to move on the waters of confusion, struggle and fear towards a deep conviction in your own heart. Peter said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Ideas are our lords and masters, they govern us. The dominant idea you now hold is your Lord. It generates its own emotion, and emotions drive you to express them. The dominant idea of success, established in your mind, creates its own mindset or feeling. This feeling propels you to act correctly, so that everything you do under the feeling of faith and confidence succeeds. Your desire or idea is now your Lord. Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Mentally appropriate your desire. Embrace it. Let it captivate your mind, feel its reality. This is your lofty, inspiring desire, wonderful enough to propel you forward. This ideal, yours, is as real as the idea of a radio in the mind of the inventor, or the idea of a car in Ford's mind, or the idea of a house in the mind of the architect. It is not idle fancy or daydream. Peter is within you, meaning Peter is faith, perseverance, attachment to it, and unwavering trust in an all-powerful power that responds to man's thought and belief. This informing consciousness within you takes the shape of your belief and conviction. It truly is everything for all men. It is strength for you if you need strength. It is guidance if you need guidance. It is nourishment and health. Everyone has faith in something. What is your faith? Let it be faith in all good things, a joyful hope for the best, and a firm belief inscribed in your heart that infinite intelligence will lift you out of your difficulty and show you the way. Now you have a firm conviction in the power of God to solve your problems and heal you. This faith in God enables you to walk on all waters of fear, doubt, worry, and imaginary dangers of all kinds. Now you know that error and fear are false beliefs without power. You understand that these negative states are false and unfounded. Paul says, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, 
the conviction of things not seen. It is from faith or feeling that all things come. When you look down, you see mud, but when you look up, you see the stars. Similarly, when you say, there is no way out, I have no chance, you resemble Peter in the winds of confusion, fear, and human opinion. But when you remember where your power lies, you look to Jesus, which means you look to the solution, the way out, the happy ending. You ignore the winds of human intellect and the waves of racial mind. The man of faith places his trust in the invisible power within him. He knows this is the realm of reality. He knows his ideal is real in the inner realm, and that his faith or feeling will give form to the formless or invisible as a condition, event, or experience. That is why the man of faith walks on water and moves confidently and understandingly towards the promised land, his precious goal. Faith is accepting as true what your reason and intellect deny. All great scientists, mystics, artists, poets and inventors are endowed or possessed by a permanent faith and confidence in the invisible inner powers. Faith is confidence. You trusted your mother when you were in her arms, you looked into her eyes and saw love there. Your Peter is your faith and confidence in God, the absolute lover, and it must be greater than faith in your mother. As you read this, Turn your desire to the subjective mind within you, acknowledging in your heart that it holds the answer and the know-how of realization, and that its ways are beyond discovery. When you are relaxed and at peace, you will know that you have successfully impregnated your deep mind. The signs follow. The wave of peace is the sign. It is inner conviction. Now you walk above all waters of confusion, chaos and false beliefs, because soon, what you felt as true will be experienced. Thro said, If a thing is true, there is a way for it to be true. Look at the magic and miraculous power of faith in your own life. As you drink a glass of milk, it transforms into tissue, muscle, bone, hair and blood cells in your body by the master chemist within you. Seek in yourself your saviour. Your true saviour is your thought and feeling. Mix them together and you will have a healthy pact, a marital bliss, the mystical marriage. Any idea or desire imbued with love is invincible. This is faith in action. Mix Peter, faith and Jesus desire together and the miracle will happen. Case histories, clinical case number one. I visited a man in prison a few months ago. His first thought was of freedom. This is symbolized in the Bible as Jesus walking on the waters of your mind. This prisoner was very bitter and cynical. I explained to him that he was in prison because of actions contrary to the golden rule. He lived under psychological pressure of hatred and jealousy. He changed his mental attitude by invoking Peter, which was his faith in an all-powerful power to fulfill the precious desire of his heart. I gave him detailed instructions. He began praying for those he hated, often saying, God's love flows through them and I release them. He did this several times a day. In the evenings before sleeping, he imagined himself at home with his family, feeling his little girl in his arms and hearing her voice saying, Welcome home, Daddy. All of this was in his imagination. After some time, he made it so real, natural and alive that it became a part of him. He had ingrained his subconscious with the belief in freedom. He no longer felt the need to pray for his own freedom. It was a sure psychological sign for him that he had subjectively embodied the desire for freedom. He was at peace, and though behind bars, he knew subjectively that he was free. It was an inner knowing. He no longer sought what he had. After subjectively realizing his desire, he no longer felt the need to pray about it. A few weeks later, this young man was released from prison. Friends came to his aid, and through proper channels, a new life was opened to him. Clinical case number two. A student in our Bible class declared there was no way to save her boyfriend from losing his store. He couldn't pay the bills, and even his car was about to be repossessed. She said, It's not possible, I see no way out, it's just hopeless. She heard one of our lectures on prayer and applied it. That night she said, I will walk on the waters of doubt and negativity and say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my strength, my God in whom I trust. She anchored her mind in the great truth that God's peace floods her mind, and God answered her. 
she remained in a calm and passive state, putting herself in the mood or feeling that there was a solution for her boyfriend, and fell asleep recalling the wonderful following words of truth, I stand quiet and see the salvation of the Lord. This young woman knew that the Saviour was in her own faith. She turned her eyes to the hills. These hills are always within reach. They are the hills of faith and trust in God that moves mountains. Mentally dismiss all evidence of the senses and look into the eyes of your Saviour. This means living in the emotional embodiment of your ideal desire. The next day, her boyfriend called her and told her that a miracle had occurred. The day after, a man who had borrowed that sum of money ten years earlier gave her a $2,000 check. It came out of nowhere as a perfect answer to her prayer of faith. Chapter C. Steps Towards Happiness Happiness is a state of consciousness. Faith and fear are states of mind. Your faith is a joyful expectation of the best. Fear comes to challenge your faith in God or in good. You must see fear as man's ignorance or false beliefs attempting to overcome his conviction in good. Never accept suggestions of illness, weakness or failure. If you hear negative suggestions and become fearful, begin to affirm God's truths such as love, peace, joy, etc. Know that thought and feeling are the causes of conditions and experiences. Fear is based on false beliefs that there are other powers and that external things and conditions can harm you. Fear must depart from you, for it has nothing to sustain it. There is no reality behind its claims. They are false. Return to the simple truth. Only your thought has power over you, and the one mighty power is now moving on your behalf as your thoughts are in harmony with the infinite. The man full of faith in God never worries about the future. When worry or fear knock on the door of his mind, faith in God opens the door, and he is at peace. I once met a farmer on the west coast of Ireland. I stayed in his house for a few days, and he always seemed happy and cheerful. I asked him to tell me his secret of happiness. His answer was, It's a habit with me to be happy. That's all the story. Prayer is a habit. Happiness too. Remember that in all languages, God and goodness are synonymous. Love is a continuous emotional attachment to goodness. In the morning, look out the window and say, This is God's day for me. I am divinely guided all day long. Everything I do will prosper. I cast the spell of God around me. I walk in His light. Whenever my attention drifts away from God or goodness, I will immediately bring it back to contemplating God and His holy presence. I am a spiritual magnet attracting to me all things that bless and prosper me. I will be wonderfully successful in all my endeavors today. I will definitely be happy all day long. Begin each day in this manner. Then you will be in happiness and you will be a radiant and joyful person. You can't experience anything outside your own mentality. Your dominant state of mind is how you think and feel inside yourself, towards others, and towards the world in general. What is your current mindset? How do you feel inside? Are you worried, confused, angry, or troubled by the actions of others? If so, you are not happy because you are mentally dwelling in limitation. Begin anchoring your mind in thoughts of peace, success and happiness. This is truly a prayer. Do this frequently and you will be like the Irish farmer who said, It's a habit with me to be happy. Your dominant mindset governs all your experiences. Therefore nothing can come into your world except the image of your mindset. Love all good things. Even your supposed enemies will be forced to do good to you. It is often found in psychological and metaphysical literature that the world you contemplate is the world you are. This means you can control your relationship with the world. The world you truly live in is a mental world of thoughts, feelings, sensations and beliefs. In fact, every person, circumstance and experience you know, becomes a thought in your mind. How you mentally feel and respond to life and conditions depends on what you believe about life and things in general. If your knowledge of life and the world is false, you can be very unhappy. If you have true knowledge and right ideas, you can control your emotional reactions to life and have inner peace. Now, you are awakening to the truth that happiness is determined by what happens in your mind. There is a very important point about being happy. You must sincerely desire to be happy. 
There are people who have been depressed, downcast, and unhappy for so long, that if they suddenly became happy because of some wonderful good and joyful news, they would actually be like the woman who told me, it's wrong to be so happy. They have been so accustomed to the old mental patterns that they don't feel at home being happy. They long for the previous state, depressed and unhappy. I met a woman in England who had suffered from rheumatism for 20 years. She would tap her knee and say, My rheumatism is bad today. I can't go out. My rheumatism keeps me miserable. This dear old lady received a lot of attention from her son, daughter and neighbours. She really wanted her rheumatism. She enjoyed her misery, as she called it. This person truly didn't want to be happy. I suggested a healing process given in the Bible. I wrote down a few Bible verses and said if she paid attention to these truths, she would be healed, but she wasn't interested. There seems to be a particular mental tendency in many people where they seem to enjoy being miserable and sad. Jesus said, if you know these things, happy are you if you do them. We should become like little children. The reason is that a child is happy because they are close to God. The child intuitively knows where happiness is. You don't have to become old, boring, grumpy, arrogant or grouchy. You also don't have to wear yourself out and become depressed. The simple truths of life, not the opinions of men, produce and generate happiness within us. There are many people who try to buy happiness by purchasing radios, televisions, cars and a country house. But happiness cannot be bought or sought in this way. The kingdom of God is within you and you don't need anything artificial to produce happiness. Some people say, if I had a million dollars, I would be happy. Others say, if I were elected mayor or president, I would be happy. The answer is that we must choose happiness. We must make it a habit. Being happy is a mental and spiritual state. Happiness comes through your daily visits with God and in silent communion with his holy presence. Start now by eating the bread of silence, meditating on the fact that in him there is fullness of joy. As you dwell on these words, imagine that God's joy and love flow through your mind and heart like a living current. Then you activate God's gift within you. The Savior is within you, but he is asleep. Wake him up. It only takes a thought to set God in motion. Every time you mentally reject the power of conditions and acknowledge God's presence within you, you activate God's gift within you. Therefore, I remind you to awaken the gift of God within you. When your mind is clear and healthy, when your eyes are devoted and focused on God or on goodness, and when you have the heart of a child, your mind is at peace. Then you are filled with goodwill and happiness. Tell yourself every morning when you wake up, God is my companion. If the day is rainy, say joyfully, what a wonder to see God in action. When it snows, give thanks. When the sun shines, know that it blesses everyone. Within you is the power to overcome any situation. You were born to win, to succeed, and to conquer. There is great joy in mastering a difficult task. Happiness is in the overcoming. Rise against the problem now. Take this bright sword of truth and say, I go forth to conquer and overcome. The power of the Almighty is within you. He will reveal the perfect solution to you. He will show you the way. Conquer and overcome every negative emotion within you. Love drives out fear. The peace of God drives out pain. Goodwill drives out envy. Amidst all kinds of adversity, seek what is good and right. In other words, seek the divine answer. Turn inward now and say every morning, there is something joyful in my path. Evil has no reality, for your evil is your disorganized mind. God is life and life seeks to express itself in paths of pleasure and peace. Its tendency is freedom. The impulse of life is progression. Life seeks to express itself through you in harmony, health, peace, joy, and happiness. These are the truths you seek. There is nothing but good in the universal cosmic conception of God. Root in your mind the omnipotence of God, and let God watch over you, guiding you in all your ways, let your mind be imbued with this idea, and the healing waters will flow through you. By focusing your attention on these truths, you make it a habit to be happy. Case Studies Case number one. I met an alcoholic in London who had fallen into the depths of degradation. 
When I met him, he was begging on the street to drink. He used to be a highly respected lawyer. I spent time with him in Hyde Park, London, telling him some simple truths. I wrote these words for him to repeat. I completely surrender myself to God and his unlimited love and goodness. My mind and heart are now open to the almighty spirit of God flowing through me. Now, God fills my mind and heart with his joy and love. I do not see the wind, but I feel the breeze on my face. Similarly, I feel God's presence stirring in my heart. The river of God's love flows through me, and I am cleansed and healed. I told him to slowly repeat this meditation for 15 minutes, three times a day. All it required was sincerity and humility on his part. Then he was assured he would be freed from the habit and blessed beyond his wildest dreams. This man became childlike in his simplicity. He held to his promise in less than a week. He engaged in a relationship with God. He truly touched the hem of his garment as he meditated aloud. He imagined the words were seeds sinking into his soul. On the sixth day, his entire being and room were flooded with an inner light that seemed to temporarily blind him. He was completely healed. Case study number two. During a conference in San Francisco a few years ago, I interviewed a very unhappy man who was deeply distressed by the way his business was going. He was the CEO. His heart was filled with resentment towards the vice president and president of the organization whom he claimed were against him. Due to this internal conflict, the business was declining and he was receiving no dividends. Here's how he prayed and resolved his business issues. Early in the morning he used the following meditation. All who work in our company are wonderful and divine spiritual links in the chain of their growth, well-being and prosperity. Goodwill radiates in my thoughts, words and actions towards my two partners and everyone in the company. God's love and goodness fill my heart for the president and vice president of our company. Infinite intelligence and divine wisdom make all decisions through me. There is only one right action unfolding in our lives. I send messengers of peace, love and goodwill ahead of me to the office, and the peace of God reigns supreme in the minds and hearts of all those in the company, including myself. Now I begin a new day full of faith and trust. This businessman repeated the above meditation slowly three times in the morning, feeling the truth behind the words. He infused life, love, truth and beauty into the words, penetrating his subconscious. When thoughts of fear or anger came to his mind during the day, he would say, God is in me now. After some time, all thoughts ceased to come, and peace came to his mind. He wrote to me from New York to say that by the end of two weeks, the president and vice president called him into their office, apologized, and shook his hand, saying the organization could not function without him. He was happy again. His joy came from seeing God in each fellow and radiating love and goodwill towards all. True happiness came to him when he practiced the presence of God. Love liberates because it is the Spirit of God. Love is the universal solvent as it dissolves everything except itself. Chapter 6. Harmonious Human Relations Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The first thing you learn is that there is no one to change except yourself. The above truth has external and internal meanings. How would you like people to think about you? Think about them in the same way. How would you like people to feel about you? Feel the same way towards them. How would you like people to act towards you? Act the same way towards them. This biblical passage is the key to happy human relationships in all aspects of life. Observe your inner conversation. For example, you may be polite to someone at the office, but when they turn their back, you are very critical and resentful towards them. In your mind, such negative thoughts are extremely destructive to you. It's like taking poison. In reality, you are ingesting mental poison that robs you of your vitality, enthusiasm, strength, direction and goodwill. The suggestion you give to others, you give to yourself. Now ask yourself the question, how am I behaving internally towards this other person? This inner attitude is what matters. Start observing yourself now. Observe your reactions towards people, conditions and circumstances. How do you react to events and news of the day? 
It doesn't matter if everyone else was wrong and you were right. If the news disturbs you, it's your fault, because your bad mood has affected you and stolen your peace and harmony. You don't have to react negatively to news or events from the external world. You can remain impassive, unchanging, and ready, realizing that you have the right to your own opinions and beliefs. What matters is never what a person says or does that affects us, but our reaction to what is said or done. Divide and hate whoever may have enslaved and imprisoned you. You have divided yourself into two people in order to discipline one. It is the spirit of the world that works within you. The other is infinity, or the expression seeking to become God through you. Be honest with yourself and determine which state of mind will prevail. For example, if someone spreads gossip about you or criticizes you, what is your reaction? Will you typically participate by being moved, feeling resentment and anger? If you do, you let the spirit of the world act within you. You must positively refuse to react in this mechanical, stereotyped and machine-like manner. Tell yourself firmly and definitively, the infinite thinks, speaks and acts through me now. This is my true being. I now radiate love, peace and goodwill towards this person who criticized me. I acknowledge the divinity within him. God speaks through me as peace, harmony and love. This is wonderful. Now you are a true seeker of truth. Instead of reacting like the crowd that returns hate for hate, you have returned love for hate, peace for pain, goodwill for malice. You have arrived at the truth. Think and react in a new way. When you arrive at the truth, you create a new set of reactions to replace the old ones. If you find yourself still reacting in the same way towards people and conditions, you are not growing. Instead, you remain immobile deeply immersed in the spirit of the world. Know that you do not have to accept negative thoughts. You can become what you want by refusing to be a slave to old thought patterns. Become the true observer and practice observing your reactions to the events of the day. Every time you discover that you are about to react negatively, tell yourself firmly, it is not the infinite that speaks or acts in this way. This will stop your negative thinking then divine love, light and truth will flow through you. At that moment, instead of identifying with anger, resentment, bitterness and hatred, immediately identify with peace, harmony and balance. With this attitude, you truly practice the art of separation. You separate yourself from the old from your current state and you identify with the new, with what you want to be. You want to be the Christ, the anointed individual, the enlightened one, the God-man. To become that ideal, you must identify with all the qualities and attributes you wish to manifest. Remember this great truth. You don't have to accept, believe or consent to negative thoughts or reactions. Begin positively refusing to react to others' negativity. Many women say, how can I change my husband? Another common statement is, I wish I could change Marie at work. She causes all the problems. Many have heard the metaphysical expression, see Christ in the other and all will be well, but most people don't exactly know what that means. It really means becoming aware of God's presence in others and realizing that God truly expresses through the thoughts, words and actions of that person. Knowing, accepting and truly believing these truths is seeing Christ in the other. There is no problem in human relationships that you cannot solve harmoniously and for the benefit of all concerned. When you say that your office colleague is very difficult to manage, distracted, petty and obsessed, you probably realize that he reflects your own internal mental states, like attracts like birds of a feather flock together. It's possible that your colleague's arrogant and critical attitude reflects your own internal frustrations and repressed anger. What this person says or does cannot really hurt you unless you allow it. The only way it can disturb you is through your own thoughts. For example, if you get angry, you must go through four steps in your mind. You started thinking about what he said. You decided to get angry and generated an angry state of mind. Then you decided to act. Maybe you responded and reacted in the same way. You see that thought, emotion, reaction and action took place in your mind. You are the cause of your own anger. If someone called you stupid, why would you get angry? You know you're not stupid. The other person is probably very mentally disturbed. 
Maybe his child died overnight, or maybe he is very psychologically ill. You must have compassion for him, but don't condemn him. Realize that God's peace fills his mind and his love flows through him. You would then be practicing the golden rule, identifying yourself not with anger or hatred, but with the law of goodness, truth, and beauty. You wouldn't condemn a person who has tuberculosis, probably not. If she told you, you would realize the presence of God, harmony, and perfection. Where is the problem? This would be compassion. Compassion is God's wisdom working through man's mind, shown when you forgive all men and see God in them. A person who is hateful, resentful, envious and jealous, and who says nasty, bad and scandalous things, is very mentally ill. He is as sick as the man who has tuberculosis. How will you react to a man like that? Where is your truth? Where is your wisdom and understanding? Will you say, I am a member of the crowd, I react in the same way? Will you return to bitterness, hatred and anger? You would not stop and say, it is not the infinite acting through me. God sees only perfection, beauty and harmony, so I see as God sees. You are purer eyes that see evil and cannot look at iniquity. I will see all men and all women as God sees them. When your eyes identify with beauty, you do not. Contemplate the distorted image. The information or news constantly attracts your attention throughout the day, through your five senses. It's you who determines what your mental responses will be to the news broadcasted. You can remain prepared, calm and serene, or you can explode in anger and consequently suffer from a migraine or another form of pain. The reason two men react differently to the same situation lies in their subconscious conditioning. Their personality is based on the sum total of all their opinions, beliefs, education and early religious indoctrination. This inner attitude of the mind conditions your response. One man may get angry listening to a specific religious program, but his brother may enjoy it because one has biases and the other does not. Our subconscious beliefs and conditioning dictate and control our conscious actions. You can recondition your mind by identifying with eternal truths. Start now by filling your mind with concepts of peace, joy, love, good humor, happiness and goodwill. Occupy your mind with these ideas, and as you do so, they will sink into your subconscious and become orchids in God's garden. No matter where the problem lies, no matter how acute or difficult it may be, the person who must change is yourself. When you change yourself, your world and environment change. Start with number one, yourself. You do not live with people. You live with your conception of them. How are you reacting now to John Jones, sitting next to you on the bench? The guy who works beside him loves his wife, loves his children. They think he's wonderful. Maybe club members think he's generous, kind, and cooperative. By considering him petty, you are frustrated. Who is this guy? Is it your concept, or is everyone wrong? Wouldn't it be wise to look inside yourself and determine what makes him ugly or bothersome to you, I'm sure you'll find it within yourself. Maybe you say to your son or father coming home, This fellow John annoys me. He irritates me. Beyond words, you are so upset you can't digest your dinner properly. According to his description, that's impossible. Where was Jones while you were saying all these things? Maybe he was at the opera with his family. Maybe he was fishing in the stream, having a wonderful and glorious time. In fact, if someone asked you where John is now, you would say, I don't know. Be honest with yourself now and admit that he is in your own mind, like a thought, concept or mental image. You reveal yourself to yourself and your own disturbed mental state. He certainly isn't responsible for your anger, tension or upset stomach. You know in your heart, which is what counts, that you are responsible for your own thoughts about him. Your negative and hostile reaction towards him is the cause of your problem. You are the cause of your negative state. Ask yourself who thinks these things and who feels them. As Kim Viss said, the suggestion we give to another, we give to ourselves. Now you can see how true that is. In fact, it is the basis of the golden rule. Never suggest to another or think something about another that you would not want the other to think, suggest or feel about you. Observe your inner conversation for yourself. How do you judge people in your mind 
when they are thousands of miles away. You can be kind with your face, but how you think about them is what counts. If you are negative, you are poisoning yourself. Does it make sense to go to a local pharmacy and say, I don't like this guy Jones, give me some poison, I want to take small doses of it several times a day. How are you reacting now? Oh, it's absurd, but that's what. You're doing when you resent or are antagonistic towards others. In reality, you're taking a mental poison that undermines your vitality, destroys your enthusiasm, and leads to weakness throughout your whole body. There are corrosive mental poisons, just as there are corrosive physical poisons. They are equally destructive. If you are now disturbed, agitated, and angry about how someone has acted towards you, it means you have a very negative thinking pattern in your consciousness that you must instantly heal. Make sure you are not one of those people who would give all the reasons why they should be angry. Stop making excuses. Cease all self-justification. How could you justify hating or resenting someone? Do you have a special license if you do? Who gave you that authority? If you are upset with another, you are responsible for your misery. You must not defile the temple of the living God. Your mind should be a house of prayer, not turn it into a den of thieves. The thieves who steal your peace, joy, health and happiness are envy, jealousy, hatred, resentment and anger. You must refuse to harbour these gangsters and murderers. You don't need to go into the dark alleys of your mind to mingle with thieves and thugs. Instead, walk through the beautifully lit streets of your mind. Jesus, or truth, always walks in the streets of your mind, saying, Come to God and find peace, rest, joy, a long life and happiness. By identifying with these truths of God, you have found your Saviour. With what you identify with, you become. You transform the image of what you contemplate and feel is true. When you go to the factory tomorrow and meet that guy or girl you say annoys you, beyond words, calm your mind and say, He is the Son of God, and God's love flows through him. I see Christ or God's presence in him. I see him through God's eyes and he is perfect, loving, peaceful and cooperative. Repeat silently to yourself several times and continue your activity. Don't worry about the results, you know the results follow your changed attitude. If the old vicious thought of resentment and anger comes to you during the day, gently and lovingly tell yourself, what is true of God is true of him. I see him as God sees him. It's wonderful to see God in action in me and in him too. Now you are observing yourself as you refuse to give in to the bad thought you identify with God or only with the good. Complete healing will follow as you persist in your new way of thinking and reacting. You are, as the Bible says, transformed by the renewing of your mind. You have changed your mental and emotional reaction towards others, and consequently, you have control over yourself. Now, you can decree how your thoughts and emotions will go. Now, you are a king over your own house, your mind. Your thoughts, ideas and feelings are your servants. You issue the command and their mission is to obey. You are there to control and not to be controlled by angry and wild emotions. Now when you ask yourself, who is the thinker in me? You must answer, it's me. When you think about anything true, honest, just, lovely and worthy of praise, you are truly thinking. If you find yourself thinking negatively, it's the thought of the world's mind in you, then you have lost control. Next time you are inclined to feel resentment towards someone, or when you say you cannot get along with another, tell yourself, when I look at his face, I see the face of God. He is an incarnation of God walking on this earth. I see God in him, and all is well. What you see in man is also what you are. If you see God, you are God. If you see dust, you are dust. Chapter 7. How to Control Your Emotions The ancient Greek said, Know thyself. As you study yourself, you appear to be composed of four parts, your physical body, your emotional nature, your intellect, and the spiritual essence called the presence of God, the I Am within you. The Divine Presence is your true identity which is eternal. You are here to discipline your intellectual, emotional, and physical nature so that they are completely spiritualized. These four phases of your nature are called the Four Beasts in the Book of Revelation by St. John, which means God reveals himself as man. The true way to discipline and master your intellectual and emotional nature is to practice the presence of God throughout the day. You have a body, which is a shadow or reflection of the spirit. 
It has no power of its own, no initiative, no will. It has no intelligence of its own. It is entirely subject to your orders or decrees. Consider your body like a large disc on which you play your emotions and beliefs. Being a disc, it will faithfully record all your emotional concepts and never deviate from them. Therefore, you can record a melody of love and beauty, or one of pain and sadness. Resentment, jealousy, hatred, anger, and melancholy are expressed in the body in the form of various diseases. As you learn to control your mental and emotional nature, you will become a channel for the divine and release the imprisoned splendor within you. Think about it for a moment. You cannot buy a healthy body with all the money in the world, but you can have health through the riches of the spirit, such as thoughts of peace, harmony, and perfect health. Now let's focus on the emotional nature of man. It is absolutely essential for you to control your emotions if you want to grow spiritually. You are considered an adult or emotionally mature when you control your feelings. If you cannot discipline or master your emotions, you are a child, even if you are 50 years old. You must remember that the greatest tyrant is a false idea that controls a man's mind and keeps him in slavery. The idea you have of yourself or others induces defined emotions within you. Psychologically speaking, emotions force you, for better or worse. If you are filled with resentment towards someone or possessed by resentment, that emotion will have a detrimental influence on you and govern your actions in a way that has nothing to do with what you say is the original cause. When you want to be friendly and cordial, you will be ugly, cynical and acerbic. When you want to succeed and prosper in life, you will find that everything goes wrong. Those of you reading this book are aware of your ability to choose a concept of peace and goodwill. Embrace the idea of peace in your mind and let it govern, control and guide you. Kimby emphasized that ideas are our masters and we are slaves to the ideas we entertain. The concept of peace with which you now live will induce the feeling of peace and harmony. Your feeling is the spirit of God operating at the human level. This sense of peace and goodwill will compel you to act rightly. You are now governed by divine ideas that are the mother of the Holy Spirit. Uncontrolled or undisciplined emotion is destructive. For example, if you have a powerful car, you might drive it across the most challenging terrain or up to the top of a high hill. However, you must control the car. If you don't know how to drive, you might hit a telegraph pole or another vehicle. If you press the accelerator instead of the brake, the car could be destroyed. It is wonderful to possess a strong emotional nature, provided you are its master. If your emotions control you, if you allow yourself to get upset over trivial matters or agitated over practically nothing, if you get angry over what you read in the newspapers, you are not controlling your emotions. You must learn to harmonize your intellect and emotions. Man's intellect is well placed, but it must be anointed or illuminated by the wisdom of God. Many people always try to intellectualize God. The infinite cannot be defined. Spinoza said that to define God is to deny him. You have met very intellectual men who say that man cannot survive death because he does not take his brain with him. In a way, they are so intelligent that they really believe the brain thinks on its own. Such a man looks at everything from a three-dimensional perspective. That is where intellect ceases. Intellect, as I mentioned before, is well placed, for example, in our daily work and in all kinds of sciences, arts and industries. However, when we approach the living almighty God within, we are obliged to leave the world of intellect and enter the realm of spiritual values which are perfection and where the dimension is infinite. When man's intellect is mixed with love, peace and goodwill, he will not use explosives and chemical knowledge to destroy humanity. The reason why man uses the atomic bomb, the submarine and other instruments of war to destroy his neighbor is that his spiritual consciousness and knowledge are far below his intellectual achievements. Let's see how emotions are generated. Suppose you observe next to you. Perhaps you feel compassion for the other. On the other hand, you may look at your young and beautiful child and feel an emotion of love welling up within you. You know you cannot imagine an emotion, but if you imagine an unpleasant episode or event from the past, you induce the corresponding emotion. Remember, it is essential to entertain the thought first before inducing an emotion. An emotion is always the exercise of an idea in the mind. 
you have noticed the effect of fear on the face, eyes, heart, and other organs. You know the effect of bad news or pain on the digestive tract. Notice the change that occurs when you realize that fear is unfounded. All negative emotions are destructive and weaken the body's vital forces. A chronic worrier usually has digestion problems. If something very pleasant happens in their experience, digestion returns to normal because normal circulation is restored and the necessary gastric secretions are no longer disturbed. The way to overcome and discipline emotions is not through repression or suppression. When you suppress an emotion, energy builds up in the subconscious and remains simmering, akin to increasing pressure in a boiler if all valves are closed and increasing the heat of the fire. Eventually there will be an explosion. Nowadays in the field of psychosomatics, we find that many cases of poor health, such as arthritis, asthma, heart problems, and failure in life, etc., can be due to repressed emotions, perhaps occurring during early childhood. These repressed emotions resurface like ghosts to haunt you later on. There is a spiritual and psychological way to banish these ghosts that wander in the dark gallery of your mind. The ideal path is the law of substitution. Through the law of mental substitution, you replace a negative and constructive thought with a negative thought. When negative thoughts enter your mind, do not fight them, just think of God and His love. You will find that negative thoughts disappear. I tell you not to resist evil. If a person is afraid, the positive emotion of faith and trust will completely destroy it. If you sincerely want to govern your emotions, you must keep control of your thoughts. By taking charge of your thoughts, you can replace love with fear as soon as you receive the stimulus of a negative emotion. Associate it with the mindset of love and goodwill. Instead of giving in to fear, say, one with God is a majority. Fill your mind with concepts of peace, love and faith in God. Then negative thoughts cannot enter. It is much easier to burn and destroy negative thoughts as soon as they enter the mind than to try to drive them out once they have taken possession of your mind. Refuse to be a victim of negative emotions by controlling your thoughts and thinking of God and His attributes. You can be master of all emotions and conditions. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. The book of Revelation deals with the control of man's intellectual and emotional life. It says in chapter 4, verses 6, 7, and 8, And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind, and the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, which was, and is, and is to come. The sea of glass before the throne signifies the inner peace of God, for God is peace. At the deepest level of your being, infinite and relaxed in a smile, is the living presence of God within you. You stand before this throne. The throne is a symbol of authority. Your emotional conviction in a deep and abiding faith in the power of God is your authority in consciousness. In other words, your inner conviction is your throne in heaven because that is where your power resides. According to your faith, your faith is granted to you. Faith is a positive and emotional attitude, knowing that the good I seek is mine. Now, the four beasts before the throne are the four facets of your spiritual, mental, emotional and physical being. To get your emotional nature on a spiritual basis, it is necessary to understand these four beasts. In doing so, you learn the subtle art of scientific prayer, which is ultimately the answer to all problems. Study these four powers of consciousness. The lion is the king of the jungle, meaning God, your I am. Bull means the bull or beast of burden, your charge is your desire. You work in your imagination to make your desire part of your consciousness. Aquarius means the water bearer, which means meditation. The word meditation means to feed on God or your good, delight in your ideal. You pour water on your ideal, which means you stop and pour love on it, which is the water of life. Something happens while you mentally delight in your ideal. You generate an emotion, 
which is the Spirit of God moving on your behalf. Your emotion is the Holy Spirit moving at a human level. God is a reactive and reciprocal power within you. Your emotion responds according to the nature of the idea. As you emotionalize your idea, it embeds itself in the subconscious mind as an impression. This is called the eagle or the scorpion, which signifies divine impregnation. These are the four stages of the unfolding or manifestation of an ideal or desire. Everything imprinted expresses itself. The four beasts each had six wings. The six wings refer to the mental and creative act, where idea and feeling blend in harmony and faith, creating a ceremony in the mind. Understanding this mental and creative act gives you wings, allowing you to rise above the storms and struggles of the world and find peace and strength within your own mind. Let's take an illustration that explains the story of spiritual and mental creation. In the name of Jehovah hides the perfect way to pray scientifically, thus placing all discordant emotions under the scientific Jehovah. yod he vav he consists of four letters. Yod means God or I am. He means desire or idea. Vav is feeling or conviction. The final he is the manifestation of what you feel as true within. The third letter, Vav, is considered the most important of all. It allows you to feel that you are what you desire to be, to walk in the mental atmosphere that you are now what you want to be. This state of mind will stir within you, and you will experience the joy of answered prayer. The word Vav also means nail. To nail your desire is to fix it in consciousness so that you are at peace. Remember, you do not have to live in a world of disease and confusion created by your own mistakes or ignorance. You have the power and ability to imagine and feel that you are what you desire to be. By fully accepting your desire mentally, by considering yourself now to be what you desire to be through mental absorption, you have completed the name or creative path of God, as described in the name Jehovah. In other words, you have accomplished the creative process in your own mind as described in biblical mystery and biblical significance. Knowing how to pray scientifically is being able to control your emotions. Prayer accomplishes more than what this world can imagine. Case Stories Case number one. A soldier returning from Korea told me that when he was gripped by fear, he repeated to himself over and over, the love of God surrounds me and goes before me. This affirmation imprinted his mind with the feeling of love and faith. This loving state of mind supplanted his fear. Perfect love casts out fear. This process is the answer to the release of fear. Case number two. A mother whose only child had passed away was overwhelmed. The grief affected her outlook and she suffered from migraines. She was in a deep state of depression. I suggested she go to the hospital and offer her services in the children's ward. She was a former nurse. By volunteering her time at a local hospital, she began to spread love to the children. She hugged them, cared for them, and fed them. Love was no longer trapped within her. She became a channel for the divine and started releasing God's sunshine of love. She practiced sublimation, which involved redirecting the energy lodged in her subconscious mind. In this way, she emptied the poisonous pockets of her subconscious mind. Case number three. A woman attending our meeting told me she experienced periodic fits of anger and rage due to actions by neighbors. Instead of letting anger and hatred mentally and physically affect her by pushing it back into her conscious mind, she transformed it into muscular energy. Taking a bucket of water and washing windows or the floor, sometimes she started gardening, saying aloud, I am tilling in God's garden and planting God's ideas. She did this for 15 minutes each time. While washing windows, she would say aloud, I am cleansing my mind with the waters of love and life. The above illustrations are simple methods for working with negative emotions in a physical way. Chapter 8. Changing Self-Feeling If you say I to everything you think, feel, say or imagine, you cannot transform your emotional life. Remember that all kinds of thoughts can enter your mind. All kinds of emotions can enter your heart. If you say I to all negative thoughts, you identify with them and cannot separate from them internally. You can refuse to unite with negative emotions and thoughts. Making this a practice 
will avoid muddy places as you walk along the path. Similarly, you must avoid walking on the muddy trails of your mind, where fear, resentment, hostility and ill will lurk and move. Refuse to listen to negative comments, do not engage with negative mindsets, and do not let them touch you. Practice internal separation by cultivating new feelings about yourself and who you really are. Begin to realize that the true self within you is the infinite spirit. Start identifying with the qualities and attributes of this infinite, then your whole life will be transformed. The secret to transforming your negative emotional nature is to practice self-observation. Observing and observing oneself are two different things. When you say observe, it means you pay attention to external things. In self-observation, attention is directed inward. A person can spend their entire life studying atoms, stars, the body, and the phenomenal world, which is knowledge of the external world. This knowledge cannot cause inner change. Self-observations are the means of inner change, the change of the heart. You must learn to differentiate, discern, separate the wheat from the chaff. Practice the art of observation when you begin to ask yourself if this idea will bless me, heal me, inspire me, give me peace, and contribute to the well-being of humanity. You live in two worlds, the external and the internal, yet both are one. One is visible and the other invisible, subjective and objective. Your external world comes in through your five senses and is shared by all. Your internal world of thoughts, feelings, sensations, is invisible and belongs to you. Ask yourself in which world do I live? Do I live in the world revealed by my five senses or in this inner world? It is in this inner world that you live all the time where you feel and suffer. Suppose you are invited to a banquet. Everything you see, hear, taste and touch belongs to the external world. Everything you think, feel, like or dislike belongs to the inner world. You attend two banquets recorded differently, one external and the other internal. It is in your inner world of thoughts, feelings and emotions that you rise and fall and sway from side to side. To transform yourself, you must begin to change the inner world by purifying emotions and properly ordering the mind through right thinking. If you want to grow spiritually, you must transform yourself. Transformation means changing one thing into another. There are many well-known transformations of matter. Sugar through a distillation process transforms into alcohol. Radium slowly changes into lead, etc. The food you eat transforms step by step into all the substances necessary for your existence. Your experiences that come as impressions must be transformed similarly. Suppose you see a person whom you love and admire. You receive impressions about them. Suppose, on the other hand, you know a person you do not like, you also receive impressions. Your husband or daughter sitting on the couch reading is to you what you conceive him or her to be. In other words, impressions are received by your mind. If you were deaf, you would not hear their voices. You can change your impressions of people. Transforming your impression is transforming yourself to change your life, change your reactions to life. You find yourself reacting in a stereotypical manner if your reactions are negative. This is how your life is defined. Never allow your life to be a series of negative reactions to impressions that come to you every day. To truly observe yourself, you must see that whatever happens, your thought and feeling are fixed in that great truth as it is in God and in heaven. This will elevate you and transform all your negative thoughts and emotions. You may be inclined to say that other people are responsible because of the way they speak or act. But if what they say or do makes you negative, you are disturbed internally. This negative state is where you live now. You move and have your being. You cannot afford to be negative. It exhausts your vitality, steals your enthusiasm and makes you physically and mentally ill. Do you live in the room where you are now? Or do you live in your thoughts, feelings, emotions, hopes and despairs? This is not what you feel about your environment now that is real to you. When you say, my name is John Jones, what do you mean? It is not a fact that you are a product of your thought, in addition to customs, traditions, and the influence of those around you as you grew up. You are truly the sum total of your beliefs, opinions, plus what comes from your education, environmental conditioning, 
and countless other influences acting upon you from the outside world and coming through your external senses. Perhaps you compare yourself to others, feel inferior in the presence of someone who seems more distinguished than you. Suppose you are a great pianist. When someone praises another pianist, you feel inferior. If you had the true feeling of I, this would not be possible, because the true feeling of I is the feeling of the presence of the infinite within you, where there are no comparisons. No matter if all the writers and commentators were wrong and he was right, the negative emotion they stirred in him was destructive, showing a lack of mental and spiritual discipline. When you say, I think this, I am bothered by that, or I don't like this, which I is speaking. It's not a different I speaking at every moment. Each I is completely different. One I within you criticizes one moment, a few minutes later. Another I speaks with tenderness. Look and learn about your different eyes and know deep within yourself that certain eyes will never dominate control or lead your thoughts. Take a good look at the eyes you associate with. What kind of people do you associate with? I mean the people who inhabit your mind. Remember, your mind is a city of thoughts, ideas, opinions, feelings, sensations and beliefs. Some places in your mind are slums and dangerous streets. However, Jesus, your Saviour, always walks in the streets of your mind in the form of ideals, desires, and life goals. One of the meanings of Jesus is your desire, because your desire, when fulfilled, is your Saviour. Your goals and objectives in life call you now. Move towards them. Focus on your desire. In other words, take a keen interest in it. Walk through the streets of love, peace, joy, and goodwill in your mind. You will meet wonderful people along the way, discover beautiful illuminated streets and remarkable citizens in the best streets of your mind. Never let your house, which is your mind, be filled with servants you do not control. When you were young, you were taught not to associate with what your mother called bad company. Now, when you start using your internal powers, you must make a special effort not to associate with erroneous thoughts within you. I had an interesting conversation with a young man studying mental discipline in France. His process involved, as he put it, taking mental photographs of himself, every now. And then he would sit down and reflect on his emotions, states of mind, thoughts, sensations, reactions, and tones of voice. Then he would say, These are not of God, they are false. I will return to God and think from that standard or rock of truth. He practiced the art of inner separation. He would stop when he got angry and say, This is not the infinite, the true me speaking, thinking or acting. It is the false self within me. Return to God. Like this young man, every time you are inclined to get angry, criticize yourself, feel depressed or get irritated, think of God and heaven and ask yourself how it is in God and in heaven. There lies the answer to becoming a new man. This is how you are spiritually reborn or experience what is called the second birth. The second birth is inner discipline and spiritual understanding. The saint and the sinner are within us all, as well as the murderer and the holy man. Similarly, God and the spirit of the world are there. Every man, fundamentally and deeply, wants to be good, express good, and do good. That is the positive within you. If you have committed destructive acts such as stealing, cheating and defrauding others and you are condemned and held in a bad light, you can rise from the whirlpool of your mind to that place in your own consciousness where you stop condemning yourself. Then all your accusers must be silent. When you stop accusing yourself, the world will no longer accuse you. That is the power of your own conscience. That is the God within you. It is foolishness to condemn oneself. You don't have to do it. It is vain to keep company with thoughts of self-accusation. Suppose you have committed acts of injustice, criminal acts, or other cowardly crimes. It was not the God within you who did those things. You were not the true self or the infinite. It was the other self, the world of the spirit within you. This, of course, does not absolve you of responsibility, just as putting your hand in the fire burns you, or running a red light results in a traffic violation ticket. The other self represents the many negative thoughts within you, such as the belief in powers outside your own consciousness, the belief that others can harm you, elements are inharmonious in addition to fears, superstitions and ignorance of all kinds. 
Lastly, prejudices, fears and gods lead you to do what you would not otherwise do. The ideal way to change the feeling of self is to place the true self within you, all that is noble, wonderful and godlike. Begin to affirm, I am strong, I am radiant, I am happy, I am inspired, I am enlightened, I am loving, I am kind, I am harmonious. Feel these mental states, believe in them, and then you will truly begin to. Live in God's garden. Everything you place in I am and believe in, you become. The I am within you is God, and there is no other I am, no life, consciousness, pure being, existence, or true being than God. He is the only cause, the only power that acts in the world. Honor Him. Live with the feeling, I am Christ, all day long. Christ means anointed, awakened, enlightened. Feel that you are this anointed one, continue to live in this mental atmosphere. Then you will draw wisdom, power and intelligence of Christ from God within you, and your entire world will be transformed by this inner light shining in your mind whenever you feel, I am Christ, I am enlightened, I am inspired. You pray and qualify your consciousness with what you pray for, thinking about it with interest. Do this silently regularly until conviction is reached in your consciousness. While doing this, the problem will no longer bother you. You will maintain your mental balance plus the feeling that I am what I want to be. And by continuing to feel it, you will become it. This is the law. I am what I feel to be. Practice changing the feeling of self every day by affirming, I am spirit. I think, I see, I feel, and I live as spirit, the presence of God. The other self within you thinks, feels, and acts as the spirit of the race. As you continue to do this, you will begin to feel that you are one with God. Just as the sun in the heavens redeems the earth from darkness and sadness, so will the realization of God's presence within you reveal the man you have always wanted to be, the joyful, radiant, peaceful, prosperous, and successful man whose intellect is enlightened by the light from above. God makes the sun shine on all men everywhere. No man can deprive you of the sunshine of God's love. No one can imprison you in fear or ignorance when you know God's truth that sets you free. The feeling that I am within you is God reveals to you that there is nothing to fear and that you are one with omnipotence, omniscience and omnipresence. No one can steal your health, peace, joy or happiness. You no longer live with the many negative thoughts of fear, doubt and superstition. Now you live in divine presence and in the consciousness of freedom. Ask yourself who takes care of me at all times and speak on behalf of it, calling yourself. Never identify with that other man, fear, prejudice, pride, arrogance, condemnation, etc. Now you realize that you do not need to go in the direction of negativity. You will never say yes to any idle and negative thought again, nor will you give it your approval and signature. Become the observer by keeping your eyes fixed on God, the true self, the infinite within you. Feel the sensation, 